Good evening. I'm Nadia Sheikh. I'm the Vice Provost for Culture and Research Engagement. I welcome you here at the Institute this evening to this talk by Professor Mary Belfiero, Research Professor at the High Council for Scientific Research in Madrid. This lecture, entitled uh, The Intellectual Crossroads of Al-Andalus, How Andalusi Scholars Shaped the Global Islamic Culture, is our last lecture in the Institute series on the legacy of Al-Andalus. I will leave it to Professor Justin Stearns to introduce Professor Fierro more fully. What I want to do now, what I want to say, is to um, share with you that the lecture this evening is part of an ongoing partnership between NYU Abu Dhabi and the Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation, ADMAF, on the theme of Al-Andalus. And I would like to say a few things in this connection. Since its founding, the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute has provided the platform for exchange about the newest developments in research and scholarship across the disciplines. Hundreds of local and international researchers have over the years shared their newest findings, theories, and ideas. For those of you who may not know, the Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation was established in 1996 by Her Excellency Huda al khamis Kano, one of the earliest cultural foundations in the Gulf region and uh, the Arab world. ADMAF has been at the forefront of the UAE's art sector, enabling creative expression through a wide range of programs and projects. By bringing together audiences and institutions, the foundation has helped embed art and culture in the heart of Abu Dhabi and the UAE. A bright example of ADMAF's institutional collaborations is the collaboration it has with NYU Abu Dhabi. For example, this partnership with the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute on the lecture series on the legacy of Al-Andalus. In connection with this theme as well, ADMAF is co-producing with the NYU Abu Dhabi Arts Center a concert next December, and the brochures are outside, so please make it next December and, and also for the earlier concerts. Uh, so it's a, it's a collaboration between the NYU Abu Dhabi Arts Center and ADMAF. Again, it's an Andalusi theme. Uh, uh, we've invited the Grammy Award-winning Catalan Spanish musician, Jordi Saval, who crafted to this end a program spanning 500 years of Arabic cultural and historic music in Andalusia. As an incubator for the arts and creativity, ADMAF has partnered uh, for many years now with the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Gallery on the Cristo and Jean-Claude uh, Award to nurture artistic talent in the United Arab Emirates. So as you see in our three public-facing programs, intellectual and artistic, we find ADMAF's fingerprint. We are grateful for the partnership, and I'm thrilled to announce that our collaboration on the lecture series between the Institute and ADMAF will continue next academic year. We will keep you posted. So now I return to our speaker. Thank you, Professor Fierro, for being with us. Professor Stearns, the floor is yours. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. My name is Justin Stearns. I run the Arab Crossroads Studies Program here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And it is a true pleasure this evening to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Maribel Fierro. Um, I have known uh, Dr. Fierro for almost 20 years at this point, and trying to sum up her intellectual stature and where she is in the field of the studies of Andus is a, truly a daunting task. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to live up to it fully, but I want to draw attention to a few highlights to give you a sense of her broader trajectory. Her first study, uh, her first book was 1993, a translation study of the Kitab la Hawadith wal Bid'a into a libro de las novedades y las innovaciones by the 12th century author um, Tortushi. And ever since then, her academic focus on discourses of inclusion and exclusion to how some people are meant to feel to belong in Muslim societies and others not, be they labeled heretics, non-Muslims, or protected populations, has continued until today. She has authored a number of books, a biography of the Umayyad Caliph Abd al-Rahman III, one more recent of the Almohad ruler uh, Abd al-Mu'min, and has been incredibly active in editing volumes on all aspects of the history of Al-Andalus and the process she's written over, I lost count at some point, trying to, over 80 chapters, uh, articles, and so forth. <clears throat> 
And while she is, to my mind, arguably the most prominent scholar internationally working on Al-Andalus today, her publications range from the early to the late Middle Ages into the current historiography surrounding Al-Andalus in Spain at the moment. Much of her contribution has been towards a broad reevaluation of the Almohad dynasty that united Iberia in North and West Africa in the 12th to 13th centuries. Here, her collected articles in the Almohad Revolution, Politics and Religion in the Islamic West during the 12th to 13th centuries has been foundational for our understanding of the Almohads, not as North African fanatics opposed to a cosmopolitan Andalusi culture as an earlier generation of scholarship would have had it, but as a dynamic and innovative messianic movement that sponsored and shaped the work of thinkers as important as Ibn Tufayl, Ibn Rushd al-Hafid, Maimonides, and Ibn Arabi. Here it's worth drawing attention to her two-volume edited collection together with Patrice Cressier and Luis Molina, Las, Los Almohades, Problemas y Perspectivas, which when it appeared in 2006, brought together a body of material that profoundly changed our understanding of the Almohades and also made it increasingly hard for the Anglophone world to ignore the central importance of work on Al-Andalus being produced in Spanish and to a lesser extent in French, something that the Anglophone world has nevertheless stubbornly continued to manage to do. It is therefore worth noting that that Dr. Fierro has not given <coughs> the has has not given that world in the North American Academy with its bias against non-English scholarship any excuse for not knowing her work and has not only published both articles and books in English but has taught and carried out research through visiting professorships in both the US and Europe. Recently, and in 2020, she brought together as editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Muslim Iberia, the single most useful research and teaching aid that we have for Andalus, a companion to her early editorial efforts in assembling the second volume of the New Cambridge History of Islam on the Islamic West from the 18th, uh, 11th to the 18th centuries. Similarly, in 2021, her volume, The Maghrib and the Mashrik, knowledge, travel, and identity has contributed to us better understanding the Islamic West as a broader constitutive part of the Muslim world, and not only as a finis terre, a recipient of Eastern trends. It is no exaggeration, then, to say that through her work over the last decades in writing, editing, and mentoring, she has profoundly shaped our understanding of Andalus in ways that will take scholars decades yet to fully appreciate. On a personal note, she has been a kind, generous, and extraordinarily knowledgeable presence, mentor, and colleague, and friend to myself over the past few decades, but also to dozens of other scholars who have passed through um, Madrid during that time. And I am still deeply grateful for the, the, the mentorship she gave me upon my first arrival to Madrid some decades ago. So it is a real pleasure then to have you here this evening and to be able to welcome um, Maribel. Sorry, I, I need this because I don't like heat, even if I come from Spain, or precisely because I come from Spain. So I have always this just in case. Hello, <laughs> good evening. Thank you very much for the kind presentation. And uh, I wish to thank uh, the organizers, and especially Nadia Al Sheikh, for this opportunity to be here with you today. It's my first time here in Abu Dhabi. I arrived yesterday, so I hope that I will have the time to discover a new place uh, uh, for me. I'll go back to this, the beginning of my presentation, sorry. Uh, uh, this, am I going, no. Uh, sorry, technical problem. Uh, so I appreciate very much this opportunity to visit a new country. I love uh, traveling, and uh, as, but especially the opportunity to talk about uh, something that uh, is of uh, interest for me at this moment, and which has been already mentioned by Justin, which is a project that I'm uh, directing uh, now together with a colleague of mine at the center that our institution has in Granada, the School of Arabic Studies, and which is called the Maghreb in the Mashrik. It's a research uh, project funded by the Spanish Ministry of Education in which, in which we are, what we are trying to uh, assess is uh, the uh, intellectual impact that Al-Andalus, and more generally the Islamic West or the Maghreb, 
had in the uh, other parts of the Islamic uh, uh, world. And I'll explain why later why this we think is important. Uh, when I will, I will, when I use the expression Islamic West, I'm uh, roughly translating the Arabic term the Maghreb, which is uh, the lands the east of Egypt, the west of Egypt. Um, usually, Cyrenaica will be considered part of the, of the east from a Maghrebi point of view. So it will be the lands that are today North Africa, excluding Egypt, plus Sicily and Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus, as you know, was the name given by the uh, Muslims to the Iberian Peninsula. So uh, these lands were not always united politically. Al-Andalus had its own um, uh, political system for a while, but there were times, as we will see, especially under the Almohads, that the, this whole region was united politically. And culturally, there were many um, convergences, uh, differences, but also similarities. So it's uh, interesting to uh, study together something that those who, of us who work on Al-Andalus have not always done. We have tended to consider that Al-Andalus was somewhat isolated from its uh, nearest context, and I think this is a mistake that we should not uh, make. What I want to stress uh, before is that I'm talking uh, I will be talking of a period covering from the 8th to the 15th century, which is a, big, it's a lot of time. And therefore, when I'm talking about the Islamic West during this period, many changes uh, happened. There were many different polities during this period. Very briefly, at the beginning, you can see um, in, the, in the map there were different polities. Polities that uh, had also different religious affiliations. There were Sunnis, there were Ibadis, uh, there were Zaydis, there were Ismailis, and uh, there were followers of, Berber, of local Berber prophets, and later there were the followers of an Almohad, of, of a Mahdi, of a Messiah, who were the Almohads. So it was not a um, a it was a geographically, it is a geographically diverse region, but also from pol a political, religious, and social point of view, there were also many differences. So in the early period, we had these different polities. Then the Fatimid Caliphate was established, which this is uh, um, the biggest extension that it uh, took. In post, in post uh, Fatimid times, that is after the, the 10th century, uh, there were again different uh, uh, polities in the area, with the Almoravids taking specially protagonists. The Almoravids were a movement of camel drivers coming from the Sahara who managed to establish an empire that we call the, Al the Almoravid Empire. And then it was under the Almohads, as I said, here we are in the 12th century, 12th, 13th century, that the whole region was uh, united under a single ruler, including Al-Andalus, because the Almohads, like the Almoravids, before occupied Al-Andalus. And then, uh, after the Almohad Caliphate failed, this, uh, the region, uh, in the, what we call the Maghreb, was divided in different uh, dynasties that more or less correspond to the states that exist today with the Marinids in what is now Morocco, roughly, the Zionists in the central Maghreb with Algeria, and the Hafsids in Ifriqiya, which we call Tunis today. And in Al-Andalus, there were also uh, very uh, many changes. Uh, at the beginning, you see in the map, uh, uh, the Muslims control almost the whole of the Iberian Peninsula. But then with the advance of the Christians, this territory started to be reduced until in the 14th century, we are here with uh, what was left of Al-Andalus, the Nazarite Kingdom in Granada, in what is now Andalusia. Because of the lack of time, I'm going to concentrate mostly on Al-Andalus, but as, as I say, I, uh, this land, the rest of the Maghreb will be present in my, in my talk. And I think it's important 
as I'm going to talk about Al Andalus with my age, I have come to realize that when I use the term Al Andalus, I have to take into account that most people have already their own image of Al Andalus. All of us have an Al Andalus in our mind. Al Andalus is a very powerful um, trope and one that is in the imaginary of many people with differences. It's not the same the Al Andalus that uh, people who have been educated and gone to school uh, in the Arab world have in their minds, the, the, the one that we in Spain have, or in Europe, or even in Indonesia, which is, uh, has its own uh, specificities. But one of the most powerful um, elements of uh, the Al Andalus that is in, in our imaginer is this idea of a lost paradise, Al Firdaus al Mafkud. Uh, Al Andalus is a lost paradise because it's lost because it was lost to the Muslims. Al Andalus ceased to exist in 1492 when uh, the last uh, Muslim polity was conquered. There were Muslims living in, in the Iberian Peninsula later on, but not, uh, they didn't have political power, so it was lost. But was it a paradise? How this, this idea of paradise uh, uh, came? Uh, the, the idea that it was lost means that there is a lot of nostalgia involved when thinking about Al Andalus, especially in the Arab and in the Muslim world. And this is very well uh, reflected in this book by Alexander Ellingson. Now, uh, if we can understand why the idea that it was lost uh, uh, came into being, it reflects a historical reality. What about the part of the Firdaus? Uh, well, the Andalusis were very good at selling how wonderful their land was. And for that, they had wonderful poets who wrote beautiful verses that especially in the Arab world are, are well known because they are written in beautiful Arabic and they are taught at schools and they are very enjoyable and very good uh, poetry. I have um, written here some verses by one of the most uh, famous um, Andalusi poets who uh, excelled in describing how beautiful the land of Al-Andalus was. And one, in one of his verses, he said, "O oh, inhabitants of Al-Andalus, what luck you have. Water, shadow, river, and trees. The eternal paradise is in your lands. If I could choose, I would choose them. Do not be afraid of entering hell, as this is not possible after having been in paradise. So this idea of living in a paradise uh, was very much promoted by the Andalusis uh, themselves. And uh, there is part of reality in it. But anybody who has traveled in the Iberian Peninsula knows that uh, uh, water, shadow, rivers, and trees is not everywhere. There are certain parts in which we don't have much water, shadow, river, on, and trees. And this uh, idea is not only found in words, but also in images. This is one of the few illuminated manuscripts that was produced in the Maghreb, contrary to other regions of the Islamic world, there was very little of uh, uh, miniatures and depictions in, uh, in the Arabic manuscripts uh, produced in the region. And here again, you, you see the garden, the trees, poets, and music. And this is another image. And one of the, this is from a manuscript co um, called Hadith Bayad Wariyad of the 13th century. And you can see that it was used in the book that I mentioned before of uh, Alexander Ellingson in one of the editions. In another edition there, you can see another iconic image of Al-Andalus that we also associate with this um, joie de vivre, this uh, atmosphere of gardens, poetry, meetings of uh, like-minded people, cultivated people who spend the time uh, reciting poetry and talking about uh, interesting things and also drinking wine. And this image is the Alhambra. 
uh, which is a very powerful uh, icon and uh, one there are many alhambras in the world because it's again it's a, it's a building that is associated with pleasure with beauty with um, uh, flowers with green as you can see in uh, in these images and uh, also with poetry poetry was not only recited in the alhambra you find the poetry in the walls of the alhambra the walls of the alhambra speak poetry there is now a wonderful um, guide that uh, in different, uh, you, you can find it in different languages if you visit the Alhambra, and in it you will find the, the Arabic verses how they are, uh, that are present in the walls of the Alhambra, how they describe the Alhambra themselves and make the Alhambra uh, speak. Now, uh, this idea of Al-Andalus as a special place, a place that was in a way uh, different from others, more beautiful than others, uh, has been explored by many scholars, very recently by Ross Brand in this book that you have in the, in the slide, in which he explores what he calls Andalusi exceptionalism. And he examines how the trope of the exceptionalism of Al-Andalus and Sepharad, Sepharad is the name that the Jews gave to the Iberian Peninsula, how this trope emerged, was consolidated, and underwent changes and reformulations during the 10th and the 13th centuries, especially after the terrible impact that the territorial losses to the Christians had on the Muslims. And he also examines how this has continued to inform later perceptions and to the present. And what he mm, says is that, in fact, the particulars of this trope were invented by the Mandalusis themselves, who um, insisted uh, in that the elements, the most important elements, were the peripheral geographical position of Al-Andalus, the fact that Al-Andalus was on the edge of the Islamic world, the fertility, it was on the edge and it was an island. It was an island because it was surrounded by the sea and by the Christians, and this gave to the Andalusis uh, a special feeling that they were at the edge of the Dar al-Islam, therefore they had to fight the enemies. At the same time, that made them a frontier society that was able to influence in different ways uh, what uh, the other side of the, of, the, of the frontier. So, but this idea that the periphery being situated in, in an edge made Al-Andalus special is very prominent in Andalusi writings. The Andalusis also insisted on the fertility of the land, how noble they were, and they preserved their Arabic uh, genealogies and their Arab lineage, we find these genealogies being preserved even in Nazareth, Granada. So at the end of the presence of uh, Al-Andalus, they were still saying, we descend from these Arab tribes. Their commitment to religious orthodoxy, their erudition and love on, on learning, and their cultural uh, sophistication. And the Jews uh, who lived in Al-Andalus and we, uh, who were very deeply Arabized, also produce an alternative image of themselves in this sense. So you can see the Andalusis had a very good view of themselves and they were able to um, um, promote it and make it known outside uh, Al-Andalus. And it's very interesting to see how this was formed, but it's also interesting to challenge it a, a bit. Because at the end, one of the important things is to remember is that this was the view of the elites, of the cultivated elites, of the learned elites. But Al-Andalus was more than that. Most of the population lived in rural areas, not in the Alhambra Palace. And uh, what they thought of their land and of themselves is very difficult to recover. And this is something that we should always insist. The point of view that we are um, 
uh, transmitting to modern audiences, we have to make it very clear that we usually we rely on writings and uh, the writing was done by certain groups of the society. Most of uh, Andalusis, as I said, will never know what they thought about their lands because they were not in the business of writing. They were just too busy doing their harvest, trying to uh, find solutions when calamities struck their villages, and trying also to not to pay too many taxes when the tax collector uh, came. And it's very difficult to recover their lives. We are lucky that archaeological work uh, has been very extensive in Al-Andalus, so we can, through the work done by archaeologists, to recover part of the lives and the material culture of these, uh, of these groups, but we also have to put a big quotation mark about what they would have thought about the vision of Al-Andalus promoted by the, by the elites. Now, uh, so my, my, when I talk about Al-Andalus, sorry, I will go back to this, I uh, want to make it very clear that uh, my, um, I'm not interested, and I usually don't work on this Al-Andalus who has acquired uh, an almost mythical character as a land where if we were being transported there at this moment, we'll go in the streets of a village or a, a town in Al-Andalus and we'll find uh, people reciting poetry and having a good time. Al-Andalus was a normal place with uh, a normal society in which many changes uh, happened and where different groups of people lived. And what I'm interested is in trying to recover the different contexts and the, the changes that took place in these societies along the way. But it's true that the idea that Al-Andalus was a periphery was existed, uh, responded to the truth, we can see that very well in the, in the map, and had consequences for uh, Al-Andalus. And one of the consequences was that the scholars of Al-Andalus traveled a lot. Uh, we usually associate Al-Andalus with some famous uh, travelers like Ben Jubair and Ben Batuta, books that uh, are um, modern bestsellers in many ways, and uh, films have been made and they have been translated into different languages, but they reflect the fact that, um, as I said, the, the scholarly elites of Al-Andalus were traveling elites. Uh, and this was so because the Andalusis knew that, especially in the early centuries, knowledge uh, was, being was being developed elsewhere in the central lands of Islam. Let's call it this way. So we find that the Andalusis had uh, their own mythical image about Baghdad, for example, as you can see in the text here. Ca Baghdad, capital of the world, source of all virtue, homeland of those who for the first ones have carried the banner of knowledge, of refinement in the practice of sciences, of manners, of sagacity, of intelligence, of penetration of the spirit, of power of thought. And if they thought that about Baghdad, of course that meant that they wanted to travel to Baghdad and be able to take part of this knowledge that um, was found there. And by doing that, they thought that they could become like Baghdadis. And in fact, they, that's one of the ways in which they describe themselves. The Andalusis are like those of Baghdad for their sagacity, intelligence, perspicacity, talent, subtlety of wit, sharpness of thought, penetration of ideas, and for their good manners, elegance, and gentleness. Again, the Andalusis were very good at speaking very well of, the, of themselves. And, but the fact is, as I said, that the Andalusis traveled a lot. And here, just to give you an example, because here the comparison, the, the comparative element is important. This is a study done about the grammarians in the early centuries of Islam by Monique Bernards that show very clearly that at the same, in the same period, there were 62 Andalusis traveling to the central lands of Islam in order to study grammar, whereas from Khurasan, only 10. 
so that uh, the, um, the, the, the movement of people coming from Al-Andalus to the central lands was very intense, especially in this early period when they knew that knowledge was found elsewhere in the central lands of Islam. Now, we can now know uh, better all this movement of people thanks to a wonderful uh, online resource called the Prosopography of the Ulama of Al-Andalus, which is a database that can be, access, uh, can be accessed freely in, uh, um, as, uh, in this site that you can find here, and which contains entries on almost 12,000 scholars that were active in Al-Andalus from the 8th to the 15th century. This is an impressive number. Hmm? This is the, if you go to this um, uh, web page that I gave you, you will find this. Most of the information is in Arabic, so you can do the search using Arabic. And it's found in uh, an institution that I mentioned before, the Escuela de Estudios Árabes, which is the center that uh, my institution has in Granada in a beautiful Morisco house that you see in the, in the image. Here you have all the places where Andalusis went in their travels during the eight centuries of existence of Al-Andalus. And you can see that they were almost everywhere in the Islamic world. This we can do thanks to this resource, but we can also see the movement of people through different uh, periods. And here I'm uh, giving you an example about the early period. This would be the eighth, uh, second half of the eighth century, beginning of the ninth century, these were the places where Andalusis went. And now uh, every 15, uh, 25 years, we are going to see changes that are happening. I'm moving so that you can see that uh, the area, for example, in Syria, this is the period uh, of the second half of the ninth century. And how in, in, in this period, which is in the 10th century, in the second half of the 10th century, Andalusis are traveling if, uh, even farther uh, east. And here is, uh, um, in, the, in the first part, you can see in red how many Andalusis uh, who were scholars traveled in the very early period. And you can see that it's a small percentage, and how that increases with time. So Andalusis traveled a lot, as you um, can see through this evidence. But uh, and they traveled because they thought that they didn't have what was required for being good Muslims in their lands. They had to learn it elsewhere. We have a wonderful book on this process of reception of the knowledge that was being produced in the East which was published by an Egyptian scholar in 1968 in Spanish. There is an Arabic translation, but the fact that he wrote it in Spanish, I think, is uh, to be commended because it's not usual. And it's a still a wonderful book that has much to offer. The, um, many years have passed since he, since he wrote it, but it's still a very delightful uh, book. And I want to pay homage to him because it was a book that influenced me a lot when I was starting my studies. I really learned a lot from it, and it opened many new perspectives in my, in my mind. I said Andalusis traveled a lot, especially in the early period. But there was a moment in which Andalusis started not to travel so much. I don't know if you are familiar with the name of Ben Hazma, who is one of the most popular Andalusi figures, but he never left Al-Andalus so that his uh, huge production, intellectual production, he wrote on almost every topic in uh, uh, law, in um, a prophetic tradition, in uh, uh, theology, in literature, poetry. He never left Al-Andalus. He found in Al-Andalus all the books he needed for his. Uh, um, he died in uh, 1064. And by this time, Andalusis were starting to think, OK, uh, we have learned a lot from the East, but we are also producing something that is valuable and that uh, we don't think 
other Muslims from other regions of the Islamic world are willing to acknowledge how good we are. And Ben Hazma, who was a very outspoken person, said that very clearly in these poems. I am the sun shining in the sky of knowledge, but my fault is to have risen in the west. Had I risen or risen in the east, great would be the plunder of my lost renown. So he wanted to make his point. Uh, this time, by now, we are in Al-Andalus have enough knowledge, and we are very good scholars, and we should be paid attention to. And uh, this we can find in other verses. This is a later author, Bendigia, who writes these verses. He, he did travel to the East, Bendigia, and when in the East, he thought that they were not uh, really reading all the Andalusian authors that they should be reading. And he said, are you not unjust in judging us of people of the East? Why do they not admire what is good and stop despising what is of value? We recite what one of our poets said, your merits make us rejoice. Why do you refuse to accept ours? Do not envy us if some stars shine in our firmament. And if you have more outstanding things to be proud of, do not treat with injustice the few we have. So analysis were becoming more assertive by this time and trying to make it clear that now they had something to, to offer. But do, what did they have to offer, the Andalusis, to the rest of the Islamic world? Here I'm going to mention two contributions with which I uh, feel very comfortable because they are not my field of study, but that fascinate me in many ways because I try hard to understand why uh, these uh, um, uh, innovations developed in Al-Andalus became so popular outside it. The first are the Muashahad. And here, because I'm not a poetic person myself, and uh, my Arabic has been learned, so I, I feel a bit uneasy to talk about uh, the Muashahad, because I think you, you, in order to understand the, the power of attraction, one has to really be able to enjoy them. The Muashahat were invented in Al-Andalus in the, towards the end of the ninth century. We know the names of the poets who are said to uh, invented it. And I am not going to go too technical into their characteristics, just to mention that what characterizes them is the use of a short song or statement in the vernacular language, either colloquial Arabic or Romance, which was the prosodic foundation of the entire poem. The uh, Muashahat underwent also changes, and it was especially a poet called Ubada ben Maasama, who died in uh, 1050, who introduced certain internal rhymes and who became the most famous, uh, one of the most famous authors of Muashahat. The point I want to make is that uh, in the East, they became crazy about the Muashahat. They, they loved them. Uh, ben Khaldun, uh, writing in, uh, in the 14th century, said, poetry was greatly cultivated in Al-Andalus. Its various ways and types were refined. Andalus is created a kind of poetry called Muashah. Everybody, the elite and the common people, liked and knew these poems because they were easy to grasp and understand. This poetry spread among the Andalusis. The great mass took to it because of its smoothness, artistic language, and the many internal rhymes found in it, which made them popular. As a result, the common people in the cities imitated them. They made poems of the Muashach type in their sedentary dialect without employing vowel endings. And they invented a new form called the Zajal, which uh, also became very popular. And according to Ben Said, who was an Andalusi, who in the 13th century settled in the East, he, saw, he said, I saw his Zayals, the Zayals of uh, Ben Kuzman, an Andalusi poet, recited in Baghdad more often than I have seen them recited in the cities in the Maghreb. So here in Baghdad, we find that Baghdadis have become crazy about something that came from uh, Al-Andalus. Uh, 
without going uh, into much uh, in, into this, uh, one of the muashahas by Obada ben Masama, Emanuali, uh, became so popular that many emulations were written about, uh, about it up to the 20th century. We know that muashahas were sung, and I wonder to what extent the, this uh, popularity of, uh, of these uh, uh, poetic forms was associated also with the, with the music. And as I said, trying to understand what, what made the, the people in the East uh, become so attracted by something that seems to have been very much rooted in a very local context, to, to enjoy it and to uh, imitate it and to emulate it. I try to think that it was the combination of this smoothness of the Arabic, but also about uh, music. In a way, the way that uh, in my, when I was young, the Beatles became known everywhere, or now salsa that is also found almost all over, it has become a kind of global um, uh, phenomenon. So that something like that must uh, have happened with the Muashahad. The other contribution that I also feel a bit uneasy talking about it um, is uh, uh, mysticism. Uh, Andalusis produced many mystical thinkers, and uh, one of the most famous is Muhyiddin in Arabi, who died in 1240. He's especially known for his doctrines on Wahdat al Wujud, and uh, it's uh, a doctrine that uh, was not always well received. There were many, uh, oppos there was uh, opposition against it on many sectors uh, in the scholarly world, and it became controversial. Alexander Nish has a wonderful book about the reception of uh, uh, Muhyiddin in Arabi's uh, uh, doctrine. And uh, what I find interesting about this aspect is. Uh, that if you remember the image that the Andalusis produced of themselves insisted in their strict Maliki orthodoxy and uh, in the fact that they were imitating Baghdad. And, but we, ha we see that the two um, biggest contribution or more known or more powerful contributions that Al Andalus made seems to have uh, been a very local way of producing poetry and an author whose uh, philosophical and mystical ideas were very controversial. So uh, we always have to challenge the representations that uh, people make of, the, of themselves and try to see to what extent they square to the, to the facts. Now I feel more comfortable because I'm going to move to the uh, contributions from Al-Andalus that I know b better and that I have worked on. So how can we find about other Andalusian contributions? Well, we live in exciting times because now we have computers who are able, which are able to do things that human beings can take us ages to, to do. Uh, Maxim Romanov is a specialist in digital humanities in the field of Islamic uh, uh, studies, and he's part of our project. And uh, um, I'm going to give you two examples of what he's able to do by using algorithms in the, um, uh, uh, using them for extracting information from uh, Arabic sources. For example, from a huge uh, biographical dictionary produced by a Dahabi, uh, the Tarikh al-Islam, which has more than 30,000 biographies which would be very difficult for a normal person to, uh, uh, to, to manage and to, to extract all the information. And he's able, for example, to show the networks, the scholarly networks that existed among these people uh, whose biographies are included in the Tarikh al-Islam in different periods of time. And here you can see how Al-Andalus, still in the periphery, still in the age of Islam, but is very well connected with other centers of the Islamic world, and in a way is also uh, becoming a center. It's important in any case to, to indicate 
that fe very few people from the East ever came to Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus never was a destination. We now tend to think that Al-Andalus was a wonderful uh, center of uh, intellectual production, which it was, but people from, um, who were not from the Maghreb, but from the, the East, from the Mashriq, never came to Al-Andalus to study. They never felt the need to, to do it. And we can talk about this later on. He, uh, Maxim Romanov has also taken a biographic, bibliographical uh, work from uh, the early uh, 20th century and uh, has, um, through this work, has mapped the intellectual production of the different regions of the Islamic world, which offers us an interesting perspective to see, in terms of, uh, of production, how Al-Andalus compares to other regions of the Islamic world. So we are now uh, able to do this kind of, uh, of things. Another possibility is to take the number of manuscripts to see which works were the most popular in the past. And that's what uh, Ross has done. And here you can see that he has been able to produce a list of the 10 most popular tafsir works that were produced in the Islamic world. And in number 10, how oh, is 20? In number 10, we have the only Andalusi contribution by a man called Al Kurtubi, who was a Cordovan who left Al Andalus and settled in, uh, in Egypt. I have myself uh, produced a, a database, which is called the History of the Authors and Transmitters of Al Andalus in which I have collected information on more than 5,000 Andalusi authors and transmitters, and of the almost 14,000 works that uh, we can know that were written or transmitted in Al-Andalus between the 8th and the 15th century. And through this database, I've been able to produce a list of the top uh, Andalusi bestsellers. I use the term bestseller, of course, not implying that here we have the same um, reality that modern bestsellers, which have their own circuits and dynamics of production, consumption, and merchandising. But by bestsellers, what I try to convey is the idea that these were hugely popular works. And we know that they were hugely popular because there were many manuscripts. There are many manuscripts of them. In many cases, in all the libraries in the world that hold um, Arabic collections, uh, collections of Arabic manuscripts, and also because uh, they were many related works were produced uh, on, on these works. I'm not going to go to the more technical aspects of the, of the list. Maybe you are familiar with some of the names that appear. I will just briefly comment on the topics and some of characteristics that I think are of interest. So what is striking in this list is that what we today consider modern bestsellers, like the, uh, sorry, the Tauq al-Hamama by Ben Hazm. I don't know how you translate it into English. The necklace of the dove. Yeah. Oh, the ring of the dove. This was never a bestseller in the past. There is only one manuscript left. So, uh, numbers allow us to, to, to grasp that we take today to have been very popular works, not necessarily was the same in the, in the past. So what do these uh, top Andalusi bestsellers talk about? They deal with the Quran, with the prophet Sira and Fadail, with the profession of faith and the five obligations from a Maliki point of view. They deal with grammar. They also deal with the so-called sciences of the Asians, with alchemy, with medicine, and with mathematics. And there is a mirror of princes included in the list. Why did they become bestsellers? Well, it was very important, the fact that of the 10 authors, four of them left Al-Andalus and settled in the Mashriq. They became bestsellers because their authors did not live in Al-Andalus. They went elsewhere and worked there and had students and able to create their own networks outside Al-Andalus. Four other four performed the Rihla, so they were also uh, they were connected to the wider Islamic uh, world. 
One never left Al-Andalus, but his work became the most popular ever. That is Hadi Iyad, who was born in Ceuta and uh, studied in Al-Andalus and was a very important local scholar. He never traveled, but his uh, Shifa, who is a, a work on the prerogatives of the Prophet Muhammad, you can find it in almost every library that holds Arabic manuscripts. Now, other characteristics of these works. Five are didactic poem works, and of these five, the three are didactic poems. So these are poems meant to be learned by heart in the pedagogical process. Uh, three of them have an encyclopedic character, and three deal with non-religious sciences, and two deal with grammar. What I found more striking when I came up with this list is that usually Al-Andalus is mostly valued because of the early period when the Umayyads ruled in Al-Andalus, which is when it was considered to have become this flourishing intellectual center. But in fact, most of these bestsellers belong to the period of the so-called Berber empires. They were produced at the time when Al-Andalus was ruled by Berbers from North Africa. And these are, you can find the list there. And in fact, they mostly come from Almohad times. As Justin said, the Almohads are a long-lasting love of mine, so I was very happy to be back with them. Now, the Almohads, in order to understand the Almohads in a brief time, look at the coins they minted. These are coins minted by the Almohads. What is striking in them is that they are square. This was the first time square coins had been minted in the Islamic world. This was a very simple, but not simplistic way on the part of the Almohads to say, something new is happening. A new era has started. Things are not as before. This is new times, and things are going to be different. I think this is the best way to summarize how the Almohads saw themselves, and they wanted to, people to see uh, themselves. Another way, and already Justin mentioned that, is to think of the, uh, these four thinkers that are related to Al-Andalus, Bentufail, the author of the self-taught philosopher, Imrushd al-Hafid, Averroes, Maimonides, and Muhyiddin in Arabi, whom I already mentioned. These are all scholars who lived in very close, uh, very close to each other, and what they have in common is that they were trained and they produced their work under Almohad rule. They are very innovative scholars. They are scholars who, when you read them, you, are, you see many windows that are opened to new, new things that might have been there before, but nobody had written about them in the way they, they did. Now, I think in order to understand, I don't think that four scholars of this caliber lived together at the same time and were able to produce the kind of uh, thought-provoking works that they produced could happen in a vacuum. Something must have been going on that made that, that helped them uh, to, to be able to develop all the, these potentialities that they, they had. And I think this has to be related to what some of these bestsellers are indicating to us. The fact that Almohads were very much interested in education. They had an a intellectual project. They had a pedagogical project. And they found ways to, um, and, and they promoted ways in order to carry out this pedagogical project. And briefly, I will uh, indicate uh, some aspects. First, it was the um, uh, interest in grammar. Grammar was very important because these were Berber empires that had mobilized the Berber-speaking populations who had to learn Arabic. And uh, in order to learn Arabic, they needed to produce pedagogical materials that would help them not only to learn it, but also to master it and be able to do things with, with it. 
This already in, in pre almohad times, a uh, uh, famous thinker, Abu Bakr Ben Al Arabi from Seville, had said, We are doing it wrong. We start teaching our students the Quran, and they don't understand enough uh, Arabic to understand the Quran. We should start with grammar, and once grammar has been uh, learned, then we should move to the, to the Quran. The first Almohad Caliph, Abdel Mumin, took a grammarian called Ben Mada with him to, to uh, Marrakesh to uh, teach his uh, sons. And Ben Mada produced a refutation of the grammarians. He said, grammarians make things too difficult. They start uh, producing too much theory and make it very difficult to understand what grammar is all about. We should make it simple because he had to face the need to educate the sons of the caliph, who were Berber speakers, and also the Almohads in general, their followers were Berber speakers. They needed to train them in Arabic. And by the way, this work by Ben Mada was, this, uh, was uh, reactivated in Egypt in the 20th century when they were trying to find ways of uh, um, establish a, a state school system in which students could master Arabic enough to uh, be able to carry out their uh, studies. Then, apart from grammar, the other three elements are encyclo encyclopedism and didactic poems. One, uh, two of the, the bestsellers is uh, the famous Shatibiya and the famous Alfiya. The first is a poem, uh, didactic poem to learn the Quranic readings, and the second is a didactic poem to learn grammar. In, and, uh, under the Almohads, didactic poems on almost every field were being produced. It's amazing. And I think the fact that uh, many of the Andalusis who emigrated to the East were able to find jobs in the East was because they were so good at producing didactic poems that they have an expertise and skills that they could sell themselves. I want to quote here Van Helder, uh, who has uh, said, well, rather paradoxically, many of these didactic poems were far from being didactic in the modern sense of the word. It is obvious that many an urjuza is not so much an introduction to be presented to beginners as a helping tool, an ed memoir. In spite of this, he says, because when we look at these didactic verses, we, how are they didactic? They are very difficult. As Van Helder explains, it seems that until quite recent times, young students were confronted with precisely such poems. The surprising thing is that this seems to have worked in many cases. So it worked. It helped them in their uh, studies. Sorry. And then there is the encyclopedic part. Uh, most of these, uh, um, like for example, the work by Ben Al Baitar in, uh, in medicine, in simples, has an encyclopedic character. And under the Almohads, encyclopedism was very much uh, what uh, was at stake. Averroes, uh, Ben Rust al Hafid, in a way, his uh, work is of an encyclopedic uh, character. Uh, uh, Maimonides as well. I, I, um, en encyclopedism is very much present in the, produ in the production. Not encyclopedism only as collecting the information. It's also about understanding the usul and uh, understanding the fundamentals of each discipline. And the best way to explain what the Almohad uh, scholars were trying to, to concentrate on, I think is explained by Ben Rushd al Hafid when he says, well, until now what we are producing, we, we train people to become shoemakers that are able to produce shoes in enormous quantities. So that you go to a shop and you get uh, almost dizzy trying to find the, the size that you require. What we should produce is shoemakers who, who when the customer comes, is able to produce a shoe at this moment that is the, the shoe that he needs not to have many already produced. We should be able to understand how to do things, how, to, how things work. And I think this um, um, 
summarizes very well what the Almohads, which was really, in my opinion, the most uh, um, thought-provoking, the most uh, innovative period in the history of Al-Andalus and the Islamic West, West was about. Thank you very much for your attention. Huh?